But anyway, uh, we were talking about we were talking about pictures, and you you uh, you sent me some great pictures, but I actually found some too that I want you to. Look oh, I at. hope the I hope it's uh, parental guidance. Oh no, I I would never I would never do a gotcha, buddy. <laughs> and besides, there's no gotchas out there. If I was this trying, the, to... this isn't the Howard Stern show. I know that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But okay, I'm going to share a screen here. I just need you to because uh, I want to start this earlier because. I have more than what you sent me, so. Okay, good. All right, here we go. So, let's, we'll start. And I'll be able to see them on that screen. Oh, do you see them now? Oh yeah, I got. Okay, that's my high school grade eleven, I think. So yeah. But actually, I think the title of it is is Dad Grade Ten. <laughs> yeah. So I, mean, I must be your kids must have had that labeled for you or something. Yeah, maybe so. Um, yeah, maybe it was. Yeah, and so what high school did you go to? Uh, Charles Tupper, 25th and Fraser down in Vancouver. And when did you start playing guitar? Uh, I'm 13 or 14. I don't think I owned a guitar until I was 14. I, I'd just go to my friend's house and borrow and sit down on their older brother's one and kind of pluck out Louie Louie or try to, you know. Wow, well, like. was that ever parallel? I played with a band for two years and I didn't own a guitar. I used to have to borrow them. Yeah, so I my, one guy got an electric guitar for his birthday one summer. He goes, hey, I'm getting rid of my acoustic you can have it for five bucks and it was like thank you god so i got holy as i paid for it and i sat under the tree that summer learning first position chords and somebody gave me a mel bay book and i kind of went from there oh and the, the old mel year, bay book eh? how many people have learned from that randy backman talks about that book all the time yeah it's uh whatever it takes you know you get some information so, so uh were you a good student not no i just uh, checked out you know I, it was that time it was late 60s early 70s Nobody, I didn't want to be there. I didn't. I matter of fact, stupid thing. Uh, my senior year, uh, I was going to class, and then I, I would because I enrolled in the high school uh, stage band. I was playing flute. Right. And being lazy, it was the lightest instrument to carry home every day. Well, is that a, that's a you know Jeff Neal played flute in our high school band too. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. Wow. But it, it reads in C, so you know it transferred right. to guitars. So right. uh, in some way, so that was kind of helpful. We were learning the notes and and uh, understanding rhythm and that a little bit. And anyway, so I did that, and I would skip. Uh, I would go to class in the morning, and then and after lunch, I would skip to the trombone player's house uh, over on Twenty Fifth and Main, and and we'd go jam Chicago songs and stuff. And and this other trumpet player, we were skipping out. So by January of that year, the principal called me down and said, listen, what's going on? You're not showing up to half these classes. What's what's the deal? I said, well, I don't even want to stay. I, I should probably just quit. He goes, I can't, I can't believe you. You've gone 11 and a half years of school. You're almost there. You're four months away. Are you crazy? Like, you, you can do this. And he kind of, you know, showed me that it was a stupid idea. He said, I'll tell you what, if you show up to every class, regardless of your grades, I'll make sure you graduate. And so I did. And uh, I got to school. So, but lesson, life lesson by this uh, principal who cared. And well, was, that's, yeah, that's nice. Out. That's nice that he actually guided you through instead and, uh, of just giving you hell and, you know, it's my way or the highway. I know. So he was, uh, 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 you know, uh, a nice soul and cared about that. I. What, what was your first guitar? Well, the one I told you about, I guess that it was a cheap acoustic. And then the next year, I know it's a stupid story, and I, but it's a true story. My friend Wayne Erickson and I from school, uh, I sold a set of golf clubs that I had, there, which I never used to a, a relative. Then I got 40 bucks for them. Went to this music store in Kingsway and and uh, Broadway area, close to my, in my school area on, I think it was a weekend. I can't remember. It was a summertime, my birthday, July 20th. Went and bought uh, this electric guitar. It was like a fake strap, you know, for 40 bucks. It, it wouldn't go. Uh, Cardboard case, walked back to his house, and we watched the landing on the moon that day. So it was you know, oh, these wow. iconic sort of memories. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my first electric guitar, and tried my best with that one. It wasn't great. And the following year, I just got rid of that, sold it to a schoolmate, and I bought a black custom copy down at San Francisco Palm Workers. And that lasted me for a year or so. And then I got a real strap, I guess, my senior year, the end of my senior year that summer. So was that the infamous white one? No, that's prior. So it was a 60s one. And I uh, auditioned for Hanley Page at 18 years old with that guitar and a Marshall amp. And they 
So, yeah, it's okay, but we prefer you had a, like a Gibson sound. So I swapped it for a, a SG for a while and then a Les Paul custom. So then those were kind of my earlier guitars, but none of those are still around. But um, the white guitar you're referring to, I had been playing the Les Paul for quite a while in Zingo, and it was doing okay. I, I it was it, it was what it was. But I really I, Jeff Beck had come out with all these great records, Blow by Blow, and I thought, ooh, I gotta have a strap. Yeah. So I went down along McQuaid and I rented one for a couple months, like twenty bucks a month or whatever it was. And I went, I gotta have this, so I just went and bought it. It was like that was it. And so that guitar became my main squeeze. Was it? Did it have a, an ebony fingerboard, a rosewood fingerboard? No, no it was made from that. It was made from, oh, okay. uh, at one point in yeah, Bowser, I know Bex had the rosewood fingerboard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, but this one, I, I just thought, okay, this will work, and it was a rhino, and I, you know, butchered it up a bit. I put a humbucking in the bridge in Bowser Moon, do a little more variety, and uh, yeah. So right into through the early years, of Brian did all those early recordings, cuts like a knife, reckless. Uh, into the fire was 86 we recorded but we'd moved over to some older vintage strats more vox ac30 chimey things cleaner and getting away from the early 80s kind of so we're using we're you using like marshall apps uh, the early recordings mm -hmm. yeah we just run them so i had a high watt for the longest time and we'd use those for the bed tracks but when it came all the uh, the real overdubbing, we went to New York and Clem, Bob Clear and I would rent these Marshalls that he knew that were good and he'd have them in the studio and we'd just plug in with maybe a distortion box and away you go, kids. Right. Um, I think the, the lick for Run to You was Brian's candy red strap that we capoed and it was the, the little hook that you hear off the top of the song, the jangle part. And it was through my Marshall combo, which I bought some music store somewhere and it was that. And the straight mic in, that's it. A little bit of chorus or something. What were you playing? Your strat? No, that was for that track. I played his candy red strat. Oh, so you, oh, so you played that guitar as well? Yeah, he there was three or four. He had a '62 strat, which we continued all up through the '90s. So that thing was amazing. That did the solo on everything I do, and and that just had this magic sort of sound that would cut through. And we Mutt, Mutt Lang really liked that guitar a lot, so we used it a lot. Well, Mark, Mark Stadnick slash Lance question. Yeah. He worked for you guys for a while. Was he able to procure quite a few collectibles for you guys? <laughs> yes, he yes he did. And uh, sadly, um, he did not survive last year. He had some health issues and succumbed, I think, due to COVID. But uh, yeah. yeah, he was a he was a guy that found a lot of stuff for us. Uh, some of which was good, and some of it was, I don't know. You know, in the end, when I went to go get rid of it, I was. I'm not going to speak badly to somebody, but I'm just saying that he he did do a lot of work, though, I have to say. You know, he found me lots of things. He got me uh, a, a 50 Sunburst last ball through my Toff, and then he was going to flip to a broker down in Pittsburgh, and I bought it from him before it left town, So, which I still have. So, I am... Um... When I, uh, when Shama broke up, there was a period between Shama and Trauma where I wasn't working and I ended up getting a job at a music store. And the guy who ran that store was Elmer Epp, who was in a band called Banshee at one point. Remember them? And of course, because Victor uh, became the singer. Well, Victor became the lead singer, but that, I think that might have been after. And, and Ian played fiddle and guitar and Ian was Shama. Yeah. But anyway, uh, but Elmer had a music store, was managing a music store. And he told me that about a month before I started working there, because I started I think, August 1st or something like that. Said, I don't know. I don't. I'm just telling you what I heard. So Elmer says this guy comes in, older kind of farmer guy comes in with this guitar case, square guitar case. Yeah. Puts it on the counter and looks, goes over and he starts looking at this um, this Yamaha acoustic guitar worth about 350 bucks. Mm -hmm. And he's playing it and and Elmer says, "Can I help?" He says, "Yeah." He says, "I, I want to play. I want to get an acoustic guitar because <laughs> my guitar needs an amplifier." And it just sits in my closet all the time, and I don't play it. And Elmer walks over and opens up the case, and it's, it's a three-pick of pick up Firebird. Oh, okay. And, and Elmer, being the consummate businessman, says, well, we'll have to see some money on it. This this Gibson's pretty old. <laughs> <laughs> so Farmer can come and get you on those, you know. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so the, the markup on a $350 Yamaha was 175 bucks. I think it was 50% markup. So I think he got like 100 bucks plus this freaking firebird and, or something like that or 50 whatever it was it was ridiculous anyway and the guy walked out with this this 
Yamaha. So he immediately phones Lance, who came down immediately and bought it for 600 bucks. Right. And apparently, according to Lance, you never know of him, that he said he put it on the auction block and Stephen Stills bought it. Okay. Wow. And he said for a ridiculous sum of money, which, you know, at the time, I think he said it was like 25000 or something like that. But who knows? Well, to, to reinforce your, your story just now, I know Mark was part of a lot of deals like that because he would tell me or I'd hear through somebody. So he was a finder. He would go to garage sales, find things that people didn't know what they had and uh, turn them around and make money. Not not all the time, but once in a while. But a lot of it was just stuff, you know. And, uh, I think Bob Rock has been more, uh, had had a way more uh, profound relationship with him in that capacity, especially like, he had Lance looking for everything under the sun because Bob's a collector as well. So well, I remember going to Lance's house one day and his entire basement was done in 1960s. Oh, yeah. Each floor of the house, the New West, was done in a different era. So it was 70s or 60s in the basement. Yeah, was in the was main basement. House and, yeah, the kitchen. And, was yeah, he had these old washers and dryers that had these incredible lights in them and stuff from yeah. like 1962. Like everything was like, it's like walking into a movie set. I know. Yeah, I've never was, seen anything like it. Yeah, he had a total focus on different, you know, nostalgia eras, and which you know is a lot of work. And, and and you have to say that some of it rubbed off on us. You know, we became involved a little bit, you know, for things. But well, is it true that he found that old precision bass, and for Brian, who then gifted it to Sting? Uh, I didn't hear that. I know he found me a Sting bass at the Dallas Guitar Show about 20 years ago, and I since um, sold it to a friend of our keyboard players who was a collector, and because I never played it, it was I was afraid to play it because it was so mint and beautiful. But I paid you know a fair amount of money for it at the time just to invest in. So and that might that might have been hearsay then. Yeah, I, I don't know that story. I'm sure there's a million, Mick, because he was into so many things. I mean, he gave so many things to Bruce Fairburn and all kinds of people. Everybody was collecting in those days. I haven't bought an old guitar in 20, 30 years. I just, I've had so much stuff here. I've never won another guitar again. And <laughs> little things, you know, I bought a Harmony Sovereign, like the one, uh, the, the Stairway to Heaven one, the 60s one. It was like $500, and I had my tech kind of... Reset. Stairway to Heaven one? Explain that story. What do you mean? Oh, the he that and Pete Townsend wrote all those great Who songs on these twelve sixty uh, harmony sovereign big body. That's that was the guitar of the day in those days. Really, yeah, I didn't know that. Wow, yeah. interesting. Uh, they're, they're cheap. They're great. They're full sounding and they're fun to play. And I mean, it's not Martin, but it's they're good. They're fun and just as an and you know for that kind of money, it's a great thing to have in the corner. So. It's like an F hole type of guitar. No, it's a it's a dreadnought. It's a, oh. like a big D size, you know, with a single hole. So. Okay, what do we got here? Well, what do we got? Look at that. Is that, is that the red strap? That is a tour strap, and to do that was brought in in the early '90s when we came out uh, "Wake Up the Neighbors." There was two of them. There was a sunburst one, the tobacco sunburst, and that one. It was Fiesta Red, and that one was did the bulk of the night for me then. So from 1991 to '96, which was that, I'm guessing that's that era. That was the 18 till I die tour. And that was a full double rack system that Bob Bradshaw put together for me. Uh, what was in What was in your rack? Oh, multiple preamps like uh, Marshall and you know those Marshall J one hundreds, what they call them. And uh, Bob Bradshaw had a three level preamp and a couple other things. Uh, what the Sans amp and things like that. So we had run different set the preamps differently for different songs. And then had a big Marshall tube power amp underneath and a bunch of delay things and a switcher, which was a relay switcher, which Bob Bradshaw was making for everybody in those days. So, yeah, so that that was my main guitar. And then around the late 90s, I brought it to a TV show in L.A. and we were rehearsing because we didn't have a, that was a three piece days. We'd have a keyboard player. And we had to do the Jay Leno show and we needed a guy to play keyboards for the spirit stuff. And this guy came in with a rehearsal space at SIR, and I'm hearing this music next to the boot, the room next to us. I said, holy crap, who's in the room next to us? Oh, it's um, Stanley Clark, Alan Holdsworth, Patrice Ruchin, Lenny White, and the girl from Yanni. It was like this major fusion extravaganza going on next door. And I, Alan Holdsworth next door? Holy crap. I said, what, what, you, you want to meet him? And I said, Lance, you know? I said, yeah. <laughs> One of my all-time heroes. And yeah. uh, 
so he came out and said he sat and talked for a little bit and i was just absolutely gobsmacked i, I just know what to say to him, alan you know and she, oh, yeah. oh, i said would you sign this and that guitar would you sign this oh i don't want to ruin your lovely guitar <laughs> Wow. Said, okay, and he signed the back, went in the case, and then never went on the road again. That's still it's still the home house here. So ah, oh, that's great. But I got to meet him, and the thing is that he did. He lived really close to me here in Vista, which is about half an hour drive away from me. And uh, up until when he passed away in two sixteen, and he played the clubs here, and he'd go down. There'd be ten people in there. I could just sit right up in the front and watch his hands. It was just wow. unbelievable. What a guitar lesson, and really took the level of modern improvisation to levels that un unseen before. And I don't think people can even grasp what his harmonic idea was so advanced and so beautiful. And uh, I, I just, wow, what a shame we've lost him. But we've lost so many in the last five years. So, I, I think it was Randy Miller. He was doing, I, I believe he was doing house mix at the town pump in Gastown. And Eric Johnson was playing there. Mm -hmm. And he walked in and Eric Johnson finished his sound check and he's looking, he's got like his cables between his pedals and stuff with those oh, yeah. gray molded cables that came with your Fender guitars and stuff. <laughs> so he says, okay, I love this guy. So he went out and got a whole bunch of Belvin cable ends and stuff. And he remade all the cables, soldered everything together, took all of his old cables away and put all this new stuff in. Eric Johnson walks in and goes, what happened to my cables? He said, well, I, I got you all these new ones. So she like, says, that's my sound. So put them back. <laughs> he liked the, the microphonic yeah. cables and stuff. He was so used to it. That's how he dialed in his sound. Yeah, he's a, he's unique and, and amazing as well. So, yeah, just the the concept. Oh, here we go. There's now you got single. it. Yeah, oh, in our glory. So I think if you were a fan then, this was probably the height of where we were as far as a band and our, we were going musically and whatever. So this was kind of a funny gig for us. We played the Peony Garden, which is on the exhibition grounds. Right. And uh, our manager at the time, we just signed a deal for like a record deal with some one-off label, a guy, an English producer. And he decided that it would be great if we did a showcase in a larger venue to show that our concert potential or whatever the thought was and so he booked this date i think we did about 500 kids yeah and it looked good and we had some lighting brought in paid for some extra lighting and things and we played a bunch of our own songs and dressed up as you can see in our finest haberdashery yeah. and it, that, that was kind of a, a good time for us then um so that's so, frank dado on drums right yes it is and so, jo joey on bass. Yeah. what's yeah. joey doing these days i haven't seen him in years I don't know. I, I The only time I, I had any kind of connection with him was a good friend of ours uh, up there, Jim Buckshawn, who was a fan. Yes, I remember Jim, yeah. He uh, he was interested in, in resurrecting and releasing any material and I could make a compilation of what we were doing. So I dug around in my boxes of stuff that down here and I found like multi-tracks of the sessions and we got the stuff, had to bake the tape and get it. And we were successful to some degree. So that was um, all from that era. And Jim was kind enough to make a, a CD of the demos and live broadcasts that we had done and make it into one sort of the unit. So that was kind of that thing. And when you say you heard me sing the tape, we never had a, a decent tape of the only song i ever wrote for these guys oh, no no the the first song i ever wrote for these guys with with them well actually i i wrote it and asked them to play it and the there was nothing that we had there was a, a live thing from a club and it dropped out halfway through so you couldn't use it so i said to hell with it we're going to re-record it and uh do you think frank and joe would be interested in doing a new bed track like and a multi-track and we got uh, somebody to help us do that and it was just like zoom or something like this or on the phone and i got them to play the track i gave them a i made a demo here and said just play along and they did how long ago was this uh six seven years ago maybe wow yeah so that was jim's you know thing he wanted to do it and i said i have no problem jim will support you but the, we, it wasn't, you know, it was just, okay, thanks. Thank you so much for being here. And that. It was just, you know, professional courtesy stuff. And no, there was no, hey, let's get together or anything like that. You know, so. oh. But Dave, uh, the guy on the far left, uh, yeah, we're yeah. still in touch a lot. And he's been great. So he's, yeah. well, Dave's a sweetheart. He's yeah, a he, really, really, really good guy. Yeah. So well, uh, he, well, they all are. Sad, sad. I, 
Vince yeah. Vince's uh, accident was absolutely freaking horrible. Yeah, yeah, terrible. And I think he he was done. He he just couldn't do this. He wanted he was when they all, half these guys went to work for C-SPAN. And my brother uh, Joe, Vince, uh, Mark, the old sound man, they just. It was kind of like a train to go, and it was a great gig, I guess, you know? Well, that's how Vince passed away, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, he was tragically, he was uh, drowned in... Uh, Did it have in, something to do with a log jam or something? No, I, I was told by my brother at the time uh, that Vince, the way they do it, they have those barges, and they're kind of sitting in, in the harbor, and they're kind of, they're all different sizes, and there's a flange that comes out uh, from the end of the barge, and there's a walkway around each barge for you to tie up on. So you have this big rope thing that keeps it from floating away. And he was going to go tie up something. And the thing was moving and he didn't see the flange. And it, the flange crushed him against the size of the other barge. And he found oh. the one drop. That's the story I was, I think. Oh, was too- how horrible. Just one of those weird things. Wrong place, wrong time, not looking around. And I don't know. You know, it's just it's terrible. Terrible ending. And that's, a, that's what I was told. This, is this Hanley Page? <laughs> yes. So again, Vince on the right, yeah. Um, second from right, Dale uh, Dutton, the bass player, Peter Paulus, the drummer, second from left, and Larry Dutton on the left. So, oh. um, yeah. So what happened in my to get to this point? I had been playing with Daryl and Craig and this drummer that we had this little band, and um, we played a church in Vancouver off Main Street and. Our bass player liked to go out to the pubs downtown, and he said, oh, I met these guys that are in this band, Andy Page, and they want to come and see us. And it was the guitar player, Doug, and Peter, the drummer. And they came and watched us play this little church gig. You know, just we're playing everything David Bowie, Jeff Beck, blah, 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 guitar stuff. And uh, the drummer said, Hey, how would you like to open up a set for us at this place called The Garage, which became uh, The Love Affair or whatever, down on over street i think and uh on a monday the next monday we're going to be doing a week there come down and play the opening set for 20 minutes okay that is kind of unusual i thought wow this is awesome we actually get to play in a club you know so we went down and played about three or four songs and uh, i came off the stage and the bass player said can i talk to you he said, we were, and pulled me aside, I said, we're thinking of getting rid of our guitar player and want to know if he'd be interested in auditioning. And I was just completely caught me off guard. I had no idea. And I said, whoa, okay. Um, you know, a million things running through your head. You know, okay, well, I, I guess I'll try it. Not really thinking anything of it. And so I learned a couple songs and went to the drummer's house the next week. And, uh, and they said, you're hired. And I was 18 going on 19, so... And that was kind of the start of it. And I went and I was pretty green. I need to learn a lot about how to work with people and playing and standing on stage and being an entertainer. And I was terrified and all that stuff. And uh, they were really, uh, really uh, patient with me and helped me. And they were a little bit older than me. So I, I don't know. They, they, it was great. It's a great experience. I, I tend to bond with Vince because he was closer to my age and maybe a little more outgoing. So. It was well, I, I remember at the body shop when I saw you at Zingo and stuff. And I, I mean, I I remember fixating on you a lot. You, whatever your stage present was, it's, it seemed very natural. And you were just such a great guitar player. And you just had a coolness about you. You didn't look like you were trying you were trying to impress anybody. You were just playing the song and doing an incredible job at it, you know. I'm just hanging on for dear life is all I was, but you know, <laughs> I, mean, I just think. But I had I had fun. I mean, my early years, I, I really had so much fun, and you didn't really make any money and all that, and you just got through, and you didn't care because it was just so new, and you just feel wow, you can do anything you want. And then when you realize that you could actually put some extra effort in and make something of your own, as terrible as it might have been, but. Um, you still, you were doing your own thing. And I I think that that was like the shackles coming off. Oh, this is going to be great. Of course, you'd play one of your songs and the club would empty and you'd be fired or whatever. <laughs> you know, Play some freaking stones, you know, whatever. So I'm so ashamed that we didn't have the foresight with Shamu. We don't have any masters, no multitracks. Nothing. Really? Not yeah. a thing. But got, what are you we got, doing? We got, we got, a, we got terrible hissy cassettes of the stuff we did. But That's weren't you it. making records at those times, like singles? No, or something? no, we never, we never, we never released anything. Everything was demo. 
We never got past the demo stage, sadly. I didn't know that. Okay, well, we did tons of demos. Uh, we like, uh, I think this guy Colin Winemaster is a. Uh, yeah. He had a studio in the East End, and we'd go in there every two months and cut the latest Ford songs that we cobbled together and just get it on tape. At least, you know. Wow, that's so great. great. We never but had the luxury. And what what is this all about? Oh well, look at me. Uh, <laughs> I guess I was going through my phone. I sent you these. And I thought they're just. They're just colors, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, just points in my life where I thought, what the heck was I doing there? <laughs> uh, we were, this is my first sort of Mediterranean area tour in the late 80s with Brian. And I think toward the end, we wound up in Israel. And uh, this was our show in this outdoor, it's, it's kind of well known, the Sultan's Pool you know, outside of Jerusalem. And it's just sort of, it's like an excavation area where they did, uh, I don't know, research for artifacts and stuff. And they made it into a concert venue. It was just a little stage, like a shed. And uh, at that time, I'd gone down into the town and bought some local clothing, like the pants and the headdress and everything, and was walking around. And people, <laughs> my friends say, you're going to get us killed. <laughs> I said, no, this is what people wear here. It's hot, you know. <laughs> we white. So I went to soundcheck wearing that, and uh, it just as a joke, somebody took that, and I thought that was great. And I'm playing my old 59 Strat there, which I still have, and that is my favorite Strat I've ever seen. So there you go. Oh, I bet. But, but that's what it was. And we had a great night, and there was great kids there. And uh, the last time we were in Israel was, what, six six years ago, seven years ago? Yeah, something like that. Did you ever own a 59 Les Paul? No, I have a 58. Oh, do you? Wow. That's the one I bought through Lance and Mike, Mike Todd. So, yeah, yeah, well, because Randy's famous one is the 59. Yeah, which, yeah, I think he talked about it. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's the, the American woman, Les Paul, and ah, No yeah. Time, all that stuff. But he never played it on stage very much because it was so heavy. It used to kill his shoulders. So <laughs> so it's still in mid shape. That's why it's in a museum in Calgary. Yeah, uh, another, they hollow them out now. They call them, oh, there you go. Yeah, he's got, he's got two of them that are chambered, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, look oh, at that. Brian's killing himself laughing at that one. Oh, I don't know what I'm saying, but uh, look at our suits. Aren't we handsome? Yeah, <laughs> it's, I think it's a good look. I remember, yeah. I remember when I saw you guys play at the Forum in, in uh, L.A., like we talked about earlier. And uh, I, remember, I remember Dave, I th something happened. I think Dave made a base mistake, and you walked over and said something to him. <laughs> and like, I caught the mistake, but it, most people wouldn't, of course. It was just one of those things he went to, you know. And 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 uh, you went over and said something, and and he laughed, and you both separated. So I remember asking you after the show. I said, "What'd you say to him?" <laughs> I walked over and told him he was fired. <laughs> Well, he could have come over to me because I probably made ten times as many as he did. So <laughs> I think if you're you're a bass player, you're naked. You know, you you have one note. And if you don't get it right, you're you're under the microscope. But uh, yeah, I'm gosh, we all screw up all the time. Still, it doesn't matter how many times you play those songs. You just you, you just it's inevitable. You're a human being. You know what? If I go to a show and I see the band screw up, I'm the happiest guy in the building. Good. Okay, human beings are on stage. You know. Yeah, it's when I'm not listening to a pre track thing and they're not miming it. Yeah, we we kid each other a lot. I, this looks like I'm playing my own sixty four. Uh, first, this might be some TV thing. It, 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 it looks like a three a three uh, a three uh, what do you call it? Colored firebird, firebird, fireburst, or sunburst? Ah, sorry, sunburst. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a three color sunburst. So yeah, I would say it's probably more like a sixty four. Yeah, yeah, it's the one I have here. It's what I've done tons of sessions with, and uh, it's just one of those guitars you can use it on a bed. Because didn't yeah. the three colors with Strat come in in 63? Before that, they were three? Uh, no, three was 59. Then was that, it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, oh. It was 57, they were still two. Yeah, okay. Yeah, some 58 into 59. Oh, there it is, the beast. There, there it is. Okay, so let's get these stories straight on the guitar. <laughs> what, did somebody actually shoot this guitar while you were playing or you were held it up in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan? Is that no. true? No, it's close. You're close. Um, it's actually Fort St. John. Okay. Now, I don't know if you ever played that place, the Condell up there. In the, no. Did you ever do those? No, oh, you, no. your agent cared about you. <laughs> <laughs> we were lucky. We never had to play those kind of rooms. Sham, we were very lucky. Anyway, you go ahead. But in hindsight, I know we got up there for two weeks, and it would be so remote. And But we always had fun. You always made it fun. And we always got work done because there was nothing to do. So we... A bug. There's a guy. What's his name? Wayne. 
Wayne Newrider, I think his name was. A big guy, Wayne. And he ran this club up in Fort St. John called the Condo. It was a bar of a hotel. And uh, he would have a Monday night afternoon cocktail thing to kind of introduce the band and who was playing. I think we actually played a couple songs. And then people could come back later in the week and, and you know, watch. So that's kind of a cool idea. It was cool, actually. Yeah. And you know, it was fine. And we played, and there's a we had some hors d'oeuvres and things. And I said to him, he's a really friendly guy and just like a, a big Paul Bunyan, big beard, overalls. And uh, I'd say, So, do you have any trouble up here? Like when people up here have too much to drink? He goes, Oh, yeah, but peace here. And he pulls out of his pocket this little five shot Derringer. It looked like a toy. And I said, That's gonna, he says, No, nah, it doesn't hurt anybody, but. If I fire it, they all run for the exit. So, okay, Wild West, here we are. And I said, hmm, interesting. I said, do you think it would go through the wall? He goes, no. Nah. Yeah, I said, we'll go through the floorboard. He goes, mm, yeah. I said, we'll go through my guitar. And I winked at him. He goes, yeah, it might go in through the guitar. I said, show me. And I, te- I was just kidding. And he walked with the guitar and he went, <laughs> it was like 7 o'clock at night and on Monday. <laughs> of course, all the people jump off. The well, where, where's the bullet hole? Where exactly? It's in, the front. it's in the front. So because there's so much on that guitar, it's hard to decipher where it would be. If you look at the upper bout in the back, it's kind of worn away. If you if you look into this picture, it's the lower right of the guitar, like near near the near where the jack goes in. You mean? No, the up the other side at the top side. Oh, so okay. you see, it's all worn away at the top. There's two points there. There's one where that original one went through. And so, of course, it went through the guitar into the floorboards of the club. And I dug the slug out. It's tiny. It's 22. And I stuffed it back in with a screwdriver. <laughs> and then later in the week or the end of the next week, we went to some party with some Navy guys and stuff. And we, it was Vince and I. We had a few beer. And he said, oh, I heard Wayne got to shoot your guitar. And I said, well, okay. And I said, you can shoot one. You know, we had a few drinks. So he brings out, I think it was a, a Winchester, but smaller bore, you know. And he opens up. He puts the guitar on the floor of his trailer. Go figure. And he goes, bang, bang. I'm saying, and then wood, I see wood chips flying. <laughs> okay, okay, that's enough. I got to play that thing. And stuff that you can see in the back, there's chunks of wood that have come out of uh, the back, but it's still intact. And I think, I don't think it's split, but I'm, I might have had to glue it back. I can't remember. But oh stuff like that. So that's what is left of there. And the guitar remained intact. Um, and then over the years, uh, you can see this people's names carved in it and stuff. Yeah. People would see me playing. So at the first, we did a whole summer in 1983 opening up for Journey. And of course, all their people were, you know, wow, what's going on with that guitar? And I said, oh, people, why is there so many names? I said, well, I just got people to say, oh, can I sign it? You know, like the assistant lighting director, Joe, or, you know, Neil Sean's roadie would sign it and whatever, you know, just they all carved their name. It sort of looked like a park bench, you know. And, yeah. You know, so it just kind of became what it was. I would light, I'd take a big lighter and the finish would go up like a plastic straw. You can see on the bottom bout. It's all black and just, you know, you're sitting around in a, you know, backstage somewhere in a room and you're goofing around. You've had too too many beer and you're just goofing around. And that's kind of what happens. And it just became this sort of joke after a while. You still play it? You can play it, yeah. Because Brian re-recorded a bunch of his stuff, uh, the label dispute thing. And uh, he's recorded a whole bunch of stuff in the last three, four years. And uh, I got to use that again for cuts like a knife and all kinds of stuff. So, because we wanted to. I went back to the original gear that you used. Yeah, tried, tried. I mean, a lot of it was rented in New York. So, at a power station. So, we couldn't get that. But enough to, you know, it's just to to do it, get as close as you can if if it's. But anyway, that that was brand new, off the shelf in Long McQuay, nineteen seventy seven, around there, I think. So, wow. yeah, so it, it's still here and it's great. Yeah, you know? <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. Aha! Uh-huh. Oh, you handsome devil! You I love that. Handsome. I love tellies with binding. Yeah, I still have that. That was a Lance find, and he uh, it was uh, routed under the pit guard. Somebody put a humbucking, and they just filled it. Aichi uh, filled it, I think, and put the guard back on, and. It's a great guitar. It's it's got lots of issues, but what year is it? Sixty six. Wow. So, uh, it's been that did a whole bunch of into the fire, 
I did a lot of things on uh, Wake Up the Neighbors. Uh, hey, babe, honey, I'm packing you in, all that. Whole I, I liked Into the Fire. I liked that album a lot. Yeah, me too. I, it was one of my higher points of recording with Brian. Just It just time, reminding you of the time you're in and the songs that were coming out. And yeah. the title track is still my favorite track I've ever done. With it, so. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool tune. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Look at that guy. I think I had exactly the same bike. Yeah. Yeah, my dad got me that for like my 12th birthday or something. And uh, I had it for quite a while and it fell apart. Of course, I trashed it. But yeah, that's just growing up in uh, in middle Vancouver. I, I lived in this big housing project, uh, 33rd in Maine, with my mom and three siblings. Well, my dad was AWOL. And uh, so. Your, your dad left when you were young? Yeah, he left when the kids were young. I was four or five. Wow. Yeah, so he met someone else. Moved to so how did your mom make ends meet? Um, I think a lot in the beginning was social assistance, and then she uh, retrained herself and got a job with the government shortly after he left and kind of carried us from there. So she raised four kids. Did you ever see your dad again? Oh, yeah, because he realized he made a mistake with the person he'd met in Quebec and came back a year or two later and sort of reconciling a little bit but yeah he's just interesting man he passed away in 1999 you know stuff that related to alcohol abuse so, wow. so, as, 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 and how about your mom uh, she passed away 216 uh, long bout with dementia from 2006 7 on and that's hard so but i did get i was traveling at the time and i was able to get back to vancouver from quite a far ways away and uh, I'll hold her hand and see her out which was you know interesting moment uh, in every capacity for me so but so my parents are gone yeah for a long time wow hence my dedication to be hopefully a relatively decent one to my own kids which you know so far they're adults now we got that that's yeah pretty... I, I think you did a great job thank you you know it uh, it was fun it was good we're lucky well, here we are we're in white is that is that a, a falcon yeah, it's a reissue White Falcon that Fred Gretsch gave to me in 1992, and no, I got aboard. And, and the White Marshals? My gosh. Yeah, yeah. But um, I th it, it almost looks like a Shama picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would love to have been in Shama, but anyway. You guys were <laughs> awesome, because you had beautiful singing and beautiful harmony, and you played all this, and people loved you, and you made way more money than anybody else, and <laughs> it, it made sense, because you were just so great, you know? It was really good. Yeah, it was, it was a good band. The, the the greatest band that never was. Well, there was a few. Do you remember, I, I, not to get off topic here, but uh, so many bands came up from Seattle. And I think yeah. the level there, it was several notches above what the local lower mainland maybe had to offer, just because of the population and I don't know, whatever. But bands would come up there like Big Horn. And Big Horn, yeah, I remember them. Shit. Well, Martin, Martin yeah. Scher produced Big Horn, and he was also the producer of the Sweeney Todd album that Brian was on, The Wishes for, Wishes for yes, Horses. He was, he was, yeah. yes. And uh, I don't know if he's still around, but yeah, Cheyenne was another one. All kinds of them. They, they come up and like, holy crap, these guys are something. They all had, all could play and all could sing and they, it was really something and uh, it was inspiring. You know, we always wait for them to come to the body shop, these great bands and stuff, you know. There was an yeah. odd band that played at the body shop called Roto the Wonder Band. Do you remember them? I don't. Well, Roto the Wonder Band was the, they were like they were like uh, this crazy kind of madcap band. That, and then at the end of every set, they'd all pick up horns and play like these weird boogie boogie things. And and the, one guy had like this this big baritone sax with buffalo horns on it and stuff. <laughs> and he'd play. And I always thought, wow, this guy's got the coolest stage presence because the way he's smiling and stuff. And then I realized, I looked across, he was looking at himself in the mirror behind the bar. He was, he was just looking at himself. <laughs> it was all this, it was the weirdest band. He had, uh, I, I wish he would would have seen him. We'd have a lot to talk about. Um, think, Nick, of all those great venues. Uh, oh, there was Oil Cans. There was... Uh, see, well, oil Cans was never part of me. I, I was never part of that. Or back, back, back in Alias? Back was in, it uh, back in it was Victoria, yeah. Oh, was it okay? There was oil can Harry's. There was one. I think there was one on Hastings Street, or was that Besitas? That's what I was thinking about. There's a whole bunch of clubs that I never got a chance to play. The only ones I really played was the Zodiac and the Body Shop, and then of course in the early '80s, then there was Whispers in North Van and all that sort of stuff opened up. But 
Um, yeah, no, that's the only clubs I actually played in Vancouver, but it was Zodiac and uh, Body Shop. Yeah, we, we, there was so many great places, just not just as a performer, but to go see people. Like you could go see Power, Tower Power at Oak and Harry's and then go see Pat Metheny upstairs in the jazz room or go to Gary Taylor's and see Sample Stearns. Or, you know, there was all this wow. wonderful, really, really amazing, talented people and just it was really great times. So, well, I remember going out to, on a break from the body shop, walking down to the cave and walking in and uh, Ginger Rogers was there. Yeah. Like Fred, oh, as Fred gig. Astaire and Ginger Rogers, yeah. My first gig with Hanley Page was the cave when we opened up for a rockabilly review. It came from Seattle or something, and uh, we did like wow. 35 minutes a night for a weekend. And it, I was absolutely terrified. I the bass player saying, You know, Keith, it's okay to lift your head up and look at the audience. Don't be afraid. <laughs> well, hey, what if I make a mistake? You know? <laughs> I remember walking into some of those clubs and they were like being in another world. You could walk in like that place, like the cave. Well, it obviously was designed like a cave with all the booths and stuff. It was such a, it was like a big Las Vegas showroom, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It was stunning. Good. And is, is this your model guitar? No, that is an old 6120 Gretsch, which I've had for quite a while. Um, I use it on a lot of sessions, especially Bob loves it He for the twangy stuff. And I, I don't play it as much as I'd like to. I, it's more of a session thing for me. But because not this guitar, another one that's a bit um, newer, I think it's one that's similar to this, was used on the Everything I Do video. Uh, right, which right. Was the song had such a great uh, reach. And they approached me and said, we really appreciate you using a Gretsch on this thing. And we're getting a lot of comments and exposure. And is there anything that you want? We'd love to help you. And I said, well, I didn't really have anything in mind specifically. And I talked to the, my guys and I said, what do you think? And they said, well, nobody's made a gold one before. I said, well, let's see if they, they want to make us a gold one and just call it, put my name on it. And so they did. And uh, they were great. And they came up with a couple of ideas. We submitted some colors to them, or car car dealership colors, which my friend uh, Wesley had provided. With, she worked for uh, car dealership. And we sent them to them. We kind of came to an agreement, and they started building them. And at one point, when they were first being made, Fred and I flew to Japan, where they were being made in Nagoya, and we kind of walked through the factory and did a little bit of... Are talking about Fred Gretsch? Yeah, Fred yeah. Gretsch. Still around, and still... They've been such a great family to us. They always send my kids birthday cards and Christmas cards. And you know, yeah, just, I met him. Um, I met him once or twice. And he always seemed like a pretty, pretty down to earth guy. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he sold the, the guitar side to Fender in like 2010 or something. So my affiliation with them became defunct and they just said, we're not handling you this anymore. So, but oh. there's probably uh, 200 of them kicking around. Uh, you know, they made, they don't make that many, the artist models. They're the smallest player of the big five. They call it so Fender, Gibson, Rickenbacker, and Guild. I mean, whatever. They're like number five. So they're way down the pipe. And I think Fender owns most of it now anyway. So, but that guitar is beautiful. It is 1950s. Is this what Brian Setzer plays? He plays versions of them, yeah. He plays the old 6120s. You know. Well, he's got Eddie Cochran's guitar. Yeah, uh, similar. And Eddie no, put I think, it I think Eddie Cochran's wife gave it to him. That's right. So various, they're all 6120 guys. Yeah, that's what they call this model, a bigger body. Great sound, great pickups. Uh, wow. Yeah, really, really fine work of art. So, Aha! Uh -huh. um, that's, that's an ad I did for uh, Band Roll-On. <laughs> <laughs> and, and certainly not for Gillette Razor because I wasn't using one. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so, uh, 85 uh, Reckless Tour uh, in America, somewhere, I guess. Yeah. And guess the guitar. We got a Floyd Rose on this one. Uh huh. The only time I've actually used one live, uh, one year. Is that the same white strap? Nope. What is it? Local Maker. Oh, is it a Lerve? It is. Wow. Yeah, I think he relocated, though, to... Kind of oh, yeah, because it's got those big Shaler pickups, and I can see that. Yeah. It's a, they're like the Fender pickups, but they got bigger magnets. I think you're right, and they're kind of exposed like a Kramer was, but it had the SH-5 uh, Seymour in the bridge area, which I, I preferred at the time, you know, and a Floyd. So he just... It was Dave Taylor that came up with the idea, and he got uh, Sean to make some basses, and 
So we went over and talked to him about guitars. I just, I just need a strat shape. And he's got the headstock. It's a slightly different cut. Right. He kind of made them and put them together. And I had a light blue one, and I think that's the white one. And I still have that one. But I had a beautiful Hervé bass that was stolen from me in Victoria, of all things. I st I'm still hoping one day it'll show up. So then, then that lasted a year, and that was it. But it did a couple of cool things. It uh, it didn't do many recordings except for I played on Brian Ferry's Slave to Love, all the middle solo and stuff like that. And uh, that's still, that guitar was responsible. So uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and I'd like to have a listing of all the all the artists you've played with. Must you know, it hasn't extensive. been that many, but, you know, compared to like, you know, Tom Bukovac or somebody, you know, from Nashville or Mike Landau or, you know, Steve Lukather, those guys, you know, they do... Like they've done thousands of sessions. I I could count like less than a hundred. I think over. Wow. Because I've been so focused on my artists, you know. Yes, of course. And thank and gratefully so. All right, there we go. Yeah. So you talked about my burst. The, that's a fifty-eight. That's your fifty-eight. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it's nice. It's well, it's a thin shape. It's good. It never gets played because it's in the case, and I have to put it in storage. And afraid it's going, you know, it's going to go up in flames if the fires come or someone's going to steal it. So right. so what's this picture all about? Um, it was a promo done for my good friend here, Mike Blake, who's a Reuters photographer. And I just thought this was a more recent, a uh, few years ago or something. And it's just, he just wanted to print pictures for, you know, like if he needed fan stuff and that. And, and the the amp is a late sixties blues breaker, like John Mayo clapped and things. So really? Yeah. And wow. I did, it didn't know it gets played really. I, I, I just the stuff that you find, you think you're going to find a use for. I think it'd be great to do a tribute or whatever a blues thing, but you never get there. It's just. But the guitar is amazing. It is what the, it's as advertised. Those things are really special, and you know, it just yeah, like the shows I do with Backman, everything's backlined. And as a matter of fact, yeah. there's so until I I got a recent endorsement with Tokai. Which who are making really good guitars That's again? Great. They yeah. make great guitars. Really good, and it, well, now the, the original guy has the company again too. Oh, so it's okay. back. Yeah, it's. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I, I was even getting my basses back. <laughs> I mean, what do I care? Is it a precision or a jazz? They're usually always set up perfectly, and it it's a USA precision or jazz. They're going to be pretty consistent. So you don't play guitar anymore, like you used to. You used to. Play oh yeah, no, I still play guitar. Yeah, it's, it's, with Randy, I play bass mostly. I mean, when I was with Backman and Turner, I played guitar and some six or eight string bass. Um, with and Fred would play four string bass. It was like our version of Big Bottom, I guess. And um, but yeah, I, then I play keyboards for other things. So I'm kind of all over the planet. Yeah. All right. Um, oh, this is a cool one. That's that's the, is that the same P and E show? Yeah, it's the same one. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's in the bottom. Somebody, uh, Dave, that's something Dave sent me, I believe. So Dave Skinner. Um, okay. Okay. So he has a, a, a pretty good collection of stuff from that era. He's, he's been so pretty That's great. the white strap before it was shot. Before it was shot, it was still intact. Uh, at some point after that, when I joined Browser Moon, uh, Ed Van Halen was big and I took black tape and wrapped it around. And, you know, how can you not acknowledge uh, that guy? He's just <laughs> changed okay. the world. There you go. Okay. There now you there's go. a good shot. And that was. Uh, By the way, it's nice to. See, there's Pat Stewart in this in this shot. It's nice and, to see him back in the band with you guys. Yeah, he's you know it was a natural choice when Mickey said he wasn't didn't wasn't keen on coming and we had Pat hadn't been subbing for Mickey uh, the previous year or so when things that Mickey couldn't make. So he says I'm not, I couldn't go to South America, Saudi Arabia. We did something there and. Couple of things that he did just didn't want to go, and Pat came in and did fine, you know. So private stuff, you know. Right. So he was a logical choice to go back, and he's been really fit in really well. And Brian loves him. So oh, he's yeah. a hell of a great guy. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. there you are with the outlaws. Yes, uh, of course. Um, great Johnny Cash on the right, and Waylon Jennings next to me with a cigarette. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what year this would have been? Uh, Eighty-five. So it would have been January of eighty-five, just before we went. To do the Tina Tour, Turner thing, I think. Oh, okay. We were around then, the spring of 85, and then we went from there to did our own dates in the United States. So, And where was it taken? Sorry? Where was the picture taken? Oh, backstage at SNL, uh, Saturday Night Live. So we oh, Saturday Night Live. Sorry, I, I missed that. Okay. And they were in the audience. Um, they were guests. Chris, uh, who was the guy that uh, was paralyzed? Uh, the Superman. Chris Reed. Oh, yeah, Chris Reed, yeah. 
So they were all in the audience and uh Reef, pardon me. So it was like, you know, New York, it was okay. And all the all the heavies are here. And it was it was fun. So I, I just what a great uh, opportunity to get to I guess this is the other side uh, when things go start moving forward for you, you get to meet people that you never thought you'd get to meet. And yeah. This is a, a good example. It's t- I got tons of this stuff, like whoever, all kinds of people, Springsteen, you never, whatever, Bowie, all kinds of things. So uh, anyway, so yeah, okay. Ah, yeah. uh, the man. Yeah. Stevie Ray Vaughan. The where guy in the middle. Where was this at? The bottom line in New York. And uh, we were in the middle of uh, a journey tour. And I think we just had recorded Heaven with Steve Smith on drums uh, for a film. And then it wound up on Reckless later. But we were in New York as a duo, two nights, a duo building, Steve Ray Vaughan and us. And uh, I remember we got in, did our sound check, and he wasn't there yet. And everybody said, we're starving. We're going to go for something to eat. And I said, you guys go. I want to see I want to see what this guy's all about. I've been hearing about him through Clear Mountain and that he did Let's Dance and all that. So I'm watching, and he's playing, he's playing his. Yeah, you know, it's pretty great, you know. And then that night, you he was on first, I think, the first night. And it was like, holy crap. <laughs> That's like Albert King. He's like Albert King. It was so real and so great. And at the end of the night, and then we play our set. At the end of the night, we get together and jam a little bit. I think we're just doing Johnny Be Good here or something. But, uh, well, who's yeah. playing drums? That's Frankie LaRocca. And he did that 1983 uh, journey thing with us up into the fall. Came to Japan that fall with us. And sadly, uh, in the early 2000s, or maybe it was less than that. Maybe it was probably just after I moved here 15 years ago. And uh, he was having a heart procedure and he passed away. On the- oh, no. Yeah. He was having heart trouble. So I don't know. He was a real character. I, I, I mean, really funny as heck. And a typical Staten Island, New York guy. And they, it's just sad that he's not here. He was amazing. Okay, that's the end of that. But I'm going to stop sharing this because I've got something else I want to, I want to get to. This is awesome. We've been here almost two hours. It feels like 20 minutes. I know. It's crazy, isn't it? Prince's Trust. Yeah. And I, I got, I came across this one. Actually, you know who supplied me with some of this stuff is John Hanna's ex-wife, Jude. Oh gosh! Because yeah, I was yeah, asking, I said, "I said, do you have anything pictures that I might be able to show Keith that he may have may not have seen?" And she goes, "Okay." So she pulled up some stuff. It's pretty cool. I'll show you the next batch. You'll, you'll like it. Well, it'll, it'll be quicker than the last. Look one. at all those names: Harry yeah. uh, Harvey Goldsmith, a famous manager pr- promoter guy in England, and uh, Boy George. Yeah, yeah. Um, look at all these people. That is great. This is London. This is. Uh, this was the one in Wembley, I think. If it was Harvey, must be. Yeah, yeah, David Evans was playing with you guys, I guess it looks like. Yeah, he sat in with us. Yeah, Jeff. Oh, man, every guitar player in the world was there. Jeff Beck was there. George Harrison. Oh, it was like Clapton was there. It was. So were you able to meet George? Yes, he was very nice, very briefly. Him, and then I met Eric and, and with Phil Collins in the hallway, and then. But Jeff didn't stick around. I thought oh, he didn't want to stick around. So, but Brian said I did. Wow! And I did meet him later at Shepherd's Bush Empire um, in two thousand. No, sorry, nineteen ninety nine, which I still have the ticket for somewhere here. Look at this. So, look at this. Oh, great! And that was after the show. He took a picture with me. Oh, and then the oh ticket. that's awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. When I'm, you know, sad that he's gone. Guy that changed the world. Here's something you probably don't have copies of. That's why I wanted to show you this. Just because it's, I mean, who would have copies of this other than maybe Jude? So that was Jude. I mean, she's so lovely. Oh, she's yeah, she seems fine. I I never talked to her, but and, um, you can see why I wanted to show you this. You're wearing a shuffle shirt. Shuffles the Nimo. <laughs> I have no idea where I got it, but uh, I got some kind of metal on too. I don't know what I'm wearing there, but uh, that was a private thing uh, for for Bows Moon. This this had yeah. to have been in Nanaimo or something. May, or maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe you just happened to be wearing the shuffle shirt. This is Bows Moon. There's your high one, I think. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, it's it's there. Was it a fifty or hundred? It's a hundred. Yeah, I still have it. Really? In oh, the garage. Good for you. I still have my lab series. <laughs> wow, those things are amazing. 
Oh, I love them. B.B. King, man. Talk about B.B. King. You were talking about singing and playing, and there's a guy that could never sing and play at the same time. He always, had, right. to, he always had to have a band. I remember that. He, he always, he, he'd play in between the way, he'd never play a chord and sing. So odd. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> that looks like it's like... Uh, Those old trainer monitors? Oh, funny, man. It looks like a private gig somewhere. It might be, yeah. There's Casey. <laughs> and Dave Johnson on drums. Yeah, the Camco drums, huh? Because that was toward the end, I think, before we started moving on. Is John. Yeah. Well, if you're in touch with Judy, please give her my regards. Oh, I will. Well, she'll see this interview for sure, so she'll hear it directly from you. Uh, uh, there we all are, the happy bunch. Look at that one. Look at that. Uh, that's somebody's wedding or something. I'm wondering if that's John Hanna's wedding. You might be right. So that's Locke, the guy, the agent, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd, I'd been with Casey, uh, Sam, yeah. Dave Johnson. I don't know he's behind him. Yeah, Jerry Berg, John, Brian uh, Johnson, the original guitar player, Glenn Anderson. Right. And me. And I, I think it's Brian Wadsworth. And that's Brian. Mushroom. Yeah. Mushroom hugging you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I had to, I had to show you that one. Anyway, <laughs> but 